first American serviceman killed in Vietnam died on December 22, 1961. His name was James P. Davis, Specialist Fourth Class of Livingston, Tennessee. This spring, ABC's Bill Gill talked with his father. Do you think that Tom died in vain, or do you think that uh, something can be accomplished there? Well, uh, Tom thought so. He thought, he thought that he was accomplishing something at the time he was there. And I think those boys in Vietnam now think they're accomplishing something. What was Tom's feelings about it? Did he write and tell you how he felt about his service there? Uh, Tom felt that, uh, that the people of Vietnam needed, needed uh, our help. Mr. Davis, how do you feel about the attempts to negotiate a peace in Vietnam? I don't believe in negotiations. The communists have never won a, a, a battle by fighting. All they've ever won is negotiating, right? They never won a scrap yet. You think that it would be a losing effort to try to negotiate? I don't with believe them. in negotiations. I believe in whipping them. If we whip them, they'll stay whipped, and we're going to have to whip them someday. We will remain in Vietnam until a just and a lasting peace can be established there. Until that time, brave men would fight on in Vietnam, would fight and would die. I hadn't seen my first casualty, for instance, until I guess three and a half months after I'd been here. It was on another seemingly routine operation. It happened very quick. I didn't realize I had a casualty until I saw him right there. Shot clean through the lungs. He looked bad. As it turned out, we got him evacuated in probably four minutes after he was shot. He was hit by a sniper, a column moving along. He was killed almost instantly. Actually, he died on the way, but the chopper was in in four minutes. I myself, as a man, didn't know how I would react to my first casualty. Uh, Frankly, I got a little uneasy in my stomach. I think all those that were around him did. But the fact remains, he got out in four minutes. After that, I can remember the next three days of that operation were very serious for us. Uh, the complexion of the war changed for the people in my platoon, and it, it went pretty much that way from then on. We didn't relax. The men, men's eyeballs were sore after an operation. They had their fingers on the triggers instead of just holding them around the stock. I lost a, my radio operator, a guy named Smitty. This guy was college material, energetic, nice-looking kid. Yeah. Couldn't stay put. He had to find out what was up front. He took off one day, went up forward in real heavy action to retrieve another man. He was told to stay out of that area. He went anyway. He was killed right away. I won't, I won't forget him for a long time. Uh, but each new day you recover and you, you go out and uh, Now I know I've seen people die. I, I know that uh, I can take it. All the others have found that we can, we can take it. The worst letter I received from Jim was when he was talking about some of his troops, his troops that had been killed. I, I think this was the most, the most difficult adjustment he's ever had to make. It's so hard for me to comprehend. I think death uh, would be the most difficult thing. Uh, it's hard to, to justify. And most of the boys were so young. I think one would not understand this situation at all unless one were to call it what it is, namely Ho Chi Minh's war. It's not the United States' war. It's Ho Chi Minh's war. Maybe Mao Zedong's war in terms of the support that he's given to Ho Chi Minh and the 
roadblocks that he's thrown against any possibilities of peace. Something of the old pioneer spirit left in, in I guess, uh, each and every one of them, because they get out here and you can get a kid from Brooklyn or a kid from Vermont. It doesn't make any difference. Somebody's been born in the city or somebody that's lived on a farm all their life. They get out there in that jungle, and normally after about a week of living out there and finding out how to, how to operate, you can't tell the difference between the two of them because they just uh, pick these uh, little skills up very, very quickly. They're hard, they're tough, and they can do any job that you give them. I found people that, that were dead for my company that were laying in the trenches right with the Viet Cong. The, the Viet Cong were, would be five or six feet away, and in that trench, or two or three feet from it, would be one of my men. Now, he'd be dead, but he'd still have his weapon in his hand. It was still pointed toward the enemy, and he still had a snarl on his face. In the beginning, he was very optimistic, and uh, he wrote very touching letters. But progressively, his letters have changed, and now they're sort of just one-page letter. I can tell that he sort of had enough, and he's ready to come home. But it's also gruesome and shocking. And believe me, honey, to watch the life drain out of man, to see a worthless shell of a body that just minutes before belonged to a moving, talking, laughing man is not pretty. And to see a man literally blown to pieces and dead women and children is certainly no adventure. No man could possibly enjoy this. As you must know, we have been in a big one with the VC, but I just can't put down on paper what went on. I'm not applying for pity or sympathy, but just to let you know a glimpse of how I feel. You think you value life and living. Well, honey, you'll never approach me now. The desire to live is paramount and what keeps everybody moving. These American troops are the best, too. You'll never imagine the strain and the hell these men have been through out here, and yet they keep on coming and moving. Honey, we are the best, and to hell with the rest of the world and public opinion. There's just something about an American that makes him better. It's just a shame that some must die because we are worth 10,000 of those slimy so-and-sos. The news comes late at night. The message goes to the bereaved by taxicab. Personal delivery is required, but many don't like it, most of all the drivers. I deliver one to Color laid out here on Large Avenue at 5 o'clock in the morning on Mother's Day. And nobody in the house but her. And, and if you gentlemen could have heard the prayer that that put up, a man would have had to have a heart of stone not to cry with that lady. You know, what can you tell one when her, when her husband is dead? Don't send me no cab driver, please. <laughs> I see a cab now and I run the other way. I don't want him on my street. He's got the wrong street. He wants the next one over. These are the wives of the first cab. I would rather, if it happened to my husband, I would rather our priest would come and tell it to me. Not only because I feel like that if, if I should go all to pieces, he would be someone there that could take over my children for just a few minutes while I more or less control myself. But then I think that you need to be closer to God at that time more than any other time maybe. And you know that this is going to be someone who understands and is going to help you along those lines. Any military wife realizes that uh, her husband lives by the sword and there's a good chance he might die by the sword. And I think we generally accept this. Uh, I also feel, I know how I would feel if, if my own husband was taken in Vietnam. I, uh, I first of all would consider it his last greatest sacrifice that he could give to his country and to me and, and my children and everybody else's children. And uh, whatever happens, I'd be very, very proud of him. And we lay there till about midnight waiting for them to come in and get us because we knew we were all going to get killed. And this guy next to me crawled off and died. And everybody was pretty messy. So this, we heard this noise. It was an American patrol. They, uh, Coming they, on foot? They, they, one of the guys who crawled out of the ambush had got back to the first of the fifth. Yeah. And they sent a patrol with about four stretchers. And they took off uh, in our company. They just quickly passed through the company because they knew the pattern were coming back. And they picked up four guys that were dying. They took all the wound, walking wounded they could. About the four. Did they take you? No, because they, uh, I couldn't walk. And uh, there were guys that were dying, had their guts hanging out. The guys with their guts hanging out? Yeah, Sergeant Nelson was, uh, he lay next to me all afternoon. See, there was no medical attention because all the medics were dead in the first few seconds because they had to move around. Yeah. 
There was no morphine, and if you get hit in the stomach, it's the most painful wound there is, and you eventually die. And his guts were hanging out, and he was sitting right, laying right next to me, and the whole afternoon he was screaming. I mean, everybody was, everybody was screaming. He was laying there screaming. And uh, then we started hearing them, the pattern coming back, you know, like little rats through the grass, they, that's what they sounded like. They started killing the wounded. You could hear them, they'd talk to each other, they, they'd call to each other when they found an American who was wounded, they'd kick him over on his stomach, and then they'd shoot him. I was down in Florida. One uh, high school boy was asking me, he says, uh, don't you really think it's a waste that you've been the four years at the academy, you're 21 years old, and now you go to a war in some place in Southeast Asia and you get killed? He says, four years of education, you're young, and, and then you're killed in a war. Don't you think it's a waste? What, what can you say? The way I feel about it is if there isn't at least one thing in this world that you're willing to die for, then, you know, what do you have to live for? There's no way you can think back and, and imagine how horrible it really was. It was so horrible. So while I think about it, and uh, I just start getting the chills and feel like I want to die just thinking about it. Yes, an experience. And, uh, it's but still a nightmare. It's still a nightmare. It always will be. It's the most horrible thing I think any human being can go through.